Is a part-time PhD the fast track to excellence, even if it takes twice as long? Now that you are in mid-career and you finally got a good job, a stable position, enough savings to pay for your higher education without going into debt, and enough maturity to go into graduate studies with a real purpose, rather than just because you're too scared of life outside the university, as is often the case for many of those 22-year-old kids, maybe, finally, now is the right time to go back and get that elusive PhD that you always secretly coveted, all the while retaining your prestigious and well-paid workplace that you invested so much into conquering. You could get the PhD on the side while keeping your great job, right? Welcome to Frank's Diana Explains. I'm a professor in the Computer Science Department of the University of Cambridge, where my job is to give people PhDs. Recently, I've got a couple of independent inquiries from a few people who want to do a part-time PhD. They already have a job, they don't want to give it up, but they want to do a PhD in Computer Science at Cambridge, perhaps supervised by me. Is it possible? I must say, I have a lot of sympathy for people willing to go back to university for a PhD as mature students after having spent several years in the real world. That's what I did myself. And that's what my PhD supervisor, Ross Anderson, also did before me. See the video above and the link in the description for more about Ross Anderson, a pioneer of security engineering and why I chose him as my supervisor. I found that doing a PhD after some industry experience gave me much greater focus and served me much better for the rest of my career than if I had done a PhD straight after my master's degree. When I was considering that big choice, sometime towards the end of the previous millennium, the University of Cambridge did not allow part-time PhDs at all. If one wanted to study at Cambridge, one had to be a full-time student. So that's the choice I faced, stay on in my job, which I loved, or quit my job in order to start a PhD. My personal circumstances ended up being slightly different, but anyway, I committed to becoming a full-time graduate student for three years, giving up what I had to give up in order to do that. And so did my supervisor in his time. We both eventually became professors at Cambridge. Nowadays, Cambridge has relaxed its rules somewhat, and it does allow part-time PhDs, but with a lot of additional conditions and restrictions at the discretion of the individual department. However, this is not a course of action I would recommend or support, even if it's allowed especially in the fast-moving field of computer science. Why? First of all, if a good PhD takes three years and a so-so PhD takes four or five, double those times for a part-time PhD and you end up with maybe eight years or more from start to finish. Six, eight, ten years to come up with a novel idea in computer science and develop it till it's convincing to the community of your peers. That's an eternity in our field. By the time you start writing it up in your dissertation, the world will have moved on and it's already going to be old and irrelevant. Secondly, being a part-time student means that the rest of your time, you're a corporate employee and you have other duties, other demands on your time, other responsibilities, worries, deadlines, projects, clients, your subordinates, your boss, your promotion prospects, not to mention your family. Plenty more stuff that takes up valuable space in your brain. And with all these distractions, that's not going to be an arrangement conducive to thinking great thoughts and doing a great PhD. A PhD is hard. It requires concentration, it requires intellectual brilliance, it requires hard work. Above all, it requires perseverance. A PhD is about coming up with new ideas that nobody had before. It's about finding solutions to problems that nobody was able to solve before. It's about banging your head against a brick wall for days, for weeks, for months, until you come up with some breakthrough. You have to want it and enjoy it, but it's difficult, it's depressing. It requires incredible amounts of concentration and persistence and creativity and determination. It requires thinking about your problem, not just nine to five, but all day long, seven days a week, as you walk around town, while you do your shopping, while you cycle to the lab, while you wash the dishes, while you're in the shower, while you're falling asleep. You have to be obsessed with your problem if you're going to find that solution that nobody else in the world has been able to find so far. You have to keep abreast of what everybody else has been doing and of what everyone else is doing right now of everything that everyone else published in the field since 1980s, of everything that people presented at that conference last month, and of all the new stuff that will come out at that other conference next October. Reading and criticizing and comparing and figuring out if your idea still has an edge or if it has already been overtaken and you must pivot towards some other unsolved problem and basically restart from zero, which does happen. And if you are running at half speed because you're only a part-time student, you're very likely to be overtaken by someone else who, unlike you, is committing fully and is doing it seven days a week. Think about it 
in business terms, okay? Imagine you spotted a fantastic opportunity in the market. You come up with a great plan to exploit it, and you form a startup. If it all goes well, then this will make you super rich. But of course, you are in competition with everyone else in the world with a similar skill set to yours who also noticed that opportunity, that gap in the market. And if you just sit there waiting, caressing your great idea, but taking your time, then someone else, with more fire in their belly, is going to beat you to it. So would you be happy if the CEO of your startup worked only part-time? If they had one of those supremely irritating signatures that say, My work days are Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Please note, I do not work on Thursdays and Fridays. Do you think your startup would go very far? Of course not. You want your CEO to be on the case eight days per week, not three. The CEO of your startup must be eating and sleeping and breathing the stuff. He or she must be on sales calls to clients all day and the rest of the time cajoling venture capitalists to fund your Series A. I faced this choice years ago. I had come up with a great invention, well, modesty aside, thanks to which I had already attracted a sizable amount of grant money and I could pay the salaries of several brilliant researchers for a few years. I had hired a team of great people. We had published a good numbers of research papers and I wanted to transition my invention and my technology to a product. So I formed a company to do that with one of my research associates. And then I quickly figured out that even though it was my baby, I could not realistically be the CEO of my own startup. I was already an academic, already very close to becoming a full professor at last, which had taken me a 15 to 20 years investment, and I wasn't going to give that up. So I could only be a CEO part-time. And I understood, thanks in no small part to my experienced mentor, Sir Andy Hopper, who had founded over 10 companies, including one with a billion dollar exit, that my startup would never be successful with a part-time CEO. So I had to start a long and difficult search for someone to be the CEO in my stead. Someone who would be sufficiently competent and enthusiastic and ambitious to lead my company to success without dumping me to the side in the process. So that's another story. And let's not get too sidetracked with the story of that startup of mine. But the relevant point is I needed a full-time CEO because a part-time CEO would be a half ass CEO and wouldn't be able to take the company to the heights I wanted it to reach. And so I understood that if I wanted to be the CEO myself, I had to give up my professorship. And if I wanted my professorship, I had to give up being the CEO of my own startup. I couldn't have both. Does this make sense? In my eyes, doing a good PhD is the same. You have to be serious about it. If you're going to do a great PhD, you have to go all in. You can't do a half-assed PhD. Personally, I wouldn't want to waste my time supervising a part-time student. No matter what you write in the agreement with your company, you can't split yourself between the responsibilities of PhD and the responsibilities of your well-established existing job. You might in total put in the same total number of hours or even more hours, but your productive output, your creative output, they're not a linear function of the number of hours you put in. There are, in this type of endeavor, heavily non-linear avalanche effects, but that positive feedback loop only gets triggered once you are in fully obsessive mode, when you're up coding all night for months on end, and you're not going to get these effects if you do a part-time PhD. I recently came across this insightful and very candid video from a famous YouTuber called Ali Abdal, of whom I've been a subscriber for years. He was a medical student here at Cambridge, graduated with a first, qualified as a junior doctor, but a couple of years later he quit medicine, cold turkey, when he saw he could make a lot more money as a YouTuber instead. And in this video, now that he's a multimillionaire, he tells you how to get rich because this is what everyone asks him these days. So he paraphrases a conversation with one of his friends who wants to know how to get rich and how not to have to work anymore and be able to do whatever she likes and so on. I asked a simple question. I was like, okay, let's call her Jane. Okay, Jane, how many hours a week would you say you are devoting to the goal of getting rich? Mm, not very many. How many books about getting rich have you read in the past year? Mm, not very many. How many videos and podcasts have you consumed about getting rich? Not very many. So he reflects on that and he says, maybe now, now that I have a team of people working for me, I can chill out a bit perhaps. But when I was on my own and I was not a millionaire yet, I consumed how to get rich material all the time during my commute, during my lunch break, whenever I had a spare moment. And the rest of my spare time, I was actually working on my business. The way to get rich, he repeats again and again throughout the video as a mantra. How do you get rich? 
by having an unhealthy obsession with getting rich. Now, I find this very honest and very genuine because although people will admire you and envy you for having made a lot of money, nobody will praise you for being obsessed with making money. So I found his confession humble and insightful. Yeah, I might have told you about work-life balance in other videos, the journey is the destination and all that, but in truth, to get where I am, I truly had to be obsessed with getting here, otherwise I wouldn't have got here. And I found, this is harsh, but that's the truth. It's a universal truth. It really applies to everything, not just about getting rich, but about anything where you want to achieve excellence. If you want to get a gold medal in a sporting competition, you have to train, train, train until it hurts, and then keep training some more and be totally obsessed with your sport. And it's the same if it's a science Olympiad instead of a sports Olympiad. Personally, I practice Kendo, the Japanese way of the sword, and it's taken me about 25 years and lots of intensive training in Japan to get to the fifth dan last year. The certificate just arrived, my wife brought it back from Tokyo, so I just framed it this morning, there it is. And if you ever meet a kendoka who is seventh dan, never mind eighth dan, then whoever that person is, rest assured, there's a story of a lifelong obsessive dedication behind that achievement. Similar, if you meet anyone who made it to full professor at the top university, same stuff, it doesn't happen other than to people who go full in. If in your 30s or 40s, you want to get in shape and get under 10% body fat, for example. Not just once, but stay there permanently, 10% body fat. That's another target you have to work very hard for. Every time you train, every time you eat, well, every time you fast for that matter, for months, for years. And of course, it's the same for getting a PhD. It may be technically allowed by the current regulations uh, to get a PhD as a part-time student, but it won't be a very good PhD, even if you get it. And you have a good chance of not making it to the end and quitting halfway through because this diluted effort doesn't let you reach that critical mass where the hard work and the good ideas finally coalesce into a chain reaction of worthwhile results. As I said in many other videos on this channel that you would do well to check out, the PhD is an apprenticeship, a training to become a scientist. You have to pay your dues, you have to be fully committed, you have to become a monk for those three years. You can't let yourself be distracted by the concurrent demands of a job in the outside world unless it's a no-brain job like, you know, cleaning floors or flipping burgers. You have to focus all your mental energies on that research problem. Are you ready for that? If you're asking about doing a part-time PhD, then perhaps you're not. So my next question has got to be, why do you want a PhD in the first place? You already have a job, a job you like, I assume, if you're not prepared to give it up, and you have been doing that job without a PhD so far. So clearly the PhD is not required for that. The PhD trains you to become a scientist, a researcher. It trains you to invent new stuff, to find solutions to problems that nobody solved before, and to write up those solutions and defend them in front of your peers in a form that will eventually add something worthwhile to the world's body of scientific knowledge. What will you be able to do with a PhD that you were not able to do without one? Do you see yourself switching from your previous career to one in which your main job is having to come up with new scientific discoveries all the time? Or are you simply after a new business card where you get to put PhD after your name, but you continue doing the managerial job you were already doing very well without a PhD? Do you expect those extra three letters might perhaps give you a promotion? I don't know. Or will they just make you feel more smug? Because these motivations are not strong enough to carry you through the intellectual and emotional hardships of actually earning a PhD, which, believe me, are significant. Plus, it would be a total waste of your training and of the effort that everyone else, not least your supervisor, put into helping you get there if, after having trained to become a researcher, you didn't actually do research and invent things and publish them and create new science. So if you're asking whether you can do a part-time PhD, I urge you to ask yourself, why do you want that PhD? Do you truly want to become a researcher? Do you want it so badly that you're prepared to pay the price of the apprenticeship and pay the price of the hard intellectual work that awaits you after you've got your PhD? And by the way, this video up there tells you a list of things that the PhD is not, and it's probably a good idea you check it out if you are considering doing a part-time PhD. If you don't actually plan on pivoting your career towards becoming a researcher, and all you really want is those three letters after your name on your business card, then my suggestion is don't bother doing a hard PhD at a top tier university. Go to an easier place. They'll certainly take a part-timer, provide you pay the fees, or even get yourself a mail-order PhD. 
Of course, as ever, these cynical comments are my own, not the official position of the University of Cambridge, which in theory does allow part-time PhDs. But if you are not willing to commit to full-time study, good luck finding a competent supervisor who is willing to take you and a supportive faculty board willing to accept your application. If instead you do want to become a researcher, then you had better commit fully and do things properly. Take three years off from your job as an extended sabbatical. You're worth it. Become a full-time student again. Come down from the comfortable pedestal of your hard-earned professional and financial status and be willing to mingle with much younger people than you who might have less experience but greater mental agility and greater creativity and might run circles around you when it comes to solving these novel problems. Be ready to get humiliated. Are you ready for that? Because you do need that training at the School of Hard Knocks if you're going to become a researcher. A lot of the outputs that a real PhD holding researcher produces during her career are rejected during peer review. I just had a paper rejected last month. It's not the first and it's not going to be the last. Is this the life you want for yourself? Do you look forward to a life where your job description is to come up with a new idea every few months? That's some pressure and write it up and defend it against criticism because that's the kind of stuff a PhD prepares you for. And you have to want that. I'm trying to give you the inside story from someone who once didn't have a PhD, worked as a software developer, then wanted a PhD, earned a PhD, has served professionally as a PhD grade researcher for decades, has published over 100 articles, has hired people with and without PhDs, has trained and supervised people to get them to earn a PhD, has examined people for a PhD, interacts daily with dozens of colleagues with PhDs, and so forth. Stick a like on the video if you find this informative. Don't believe the fantasy stories about PhDs from people who don't know what they're talking about. For example, if they only talk about their own experience earning their own PhD, just a sample size of one. At the same time, I know I'm opinionated and that some of the things I told you are facts and some others are my personal opinion about these facts. So feel free to disagree with me in the comments. What do you think about all this? Write it down. And if you say lampshade, in your comment, then I'll know you watched till the end, which I always appreciate. Best wishes, and I'll see you in the next video.